Now, can you think of anybody who might want to do a thing like this? How about that phone call? I told you before, I can't. I find it very hard to believe. Well, we'll have to talk to the people that you know, the people around you. We'd appreciate it if you didn't tell anybody what we were after. If you want it that way, it's so hard to believe. I still think you're wrong. Looks like it's going to rain. Be good for the flowers. It's been dry up in the valley. Farmers need the rain. Yes, sir. Now, you'll go along with us on this thing, will you? Not tell anybody about it? Sure, I'll help. It's all right if I tell my daughter and son-in-law about it, isn't it? Well, it'd be better if you didn't say anything to him or your daughter, not to anybody. But they're going to see you here. They're going to ask questions. They're not stupid. Yes, yeah, sir, so you could tell them that we were asking about somebody that you employ. How'll that be? What do I say if Robert asks what's about? I, I have no secrets for him. Well, tell him we ask you not to tell anybody about it. Tell him it's police business. It happens all the time. I suppose I could do that, but I don't like it. I don't like it at all. It's lying. Yes, sir, that may be true, but it's the best way. Oh, I guess it's a small lie. I can tell myself that. It's a small lie. I will have some policemen come out and watch Mr. Elric until we find the person who's doing this. Do you have to do that? Yes, sir, I'm afraid so. Well, no, I, I don't like that at all. Even worse than the lying. No, no, I don't like it at all. Mr. Elric, I wonder if you really understand that when we ask you not to tell anybody about this, when we want to keep you under surveillance, it's just for your protection. But if what you say is true, if somebody really does want to kill me, if somebody hates me that much... Yes, sir. Can you stop them? We called the office and had a team of men sent out to keep Wilhelm Ulrich under surveillance. His house and his person were to be watched 24 hours a day until we apprehended the person or persons who wanted him killed. We spent the rest of the afternoon talking to the people in the neighborhood. From all of them, we got the same story. Ulrich was liked and respected through the area. All of the local shopkeepers and their business associates told us that he paid cash for everything he bought and that his credit was good. He was active in the local flower club and had twice in the past served as president of the organization. The neighbors confirmed what Ulrich had told us about his family. His son-in-law and his daughter seemed to be devoted to the elderly man and were constantly trying to get him to sell the house he lived in and come to live with them. 6.42 p.m., we returned to the office. Man, it's really coming down, huh? Yeah, it sure is. You got a raincoat in your locker? Yeah, I got one of those plastic kind in the bag. Oh, yeah, I want to get me one of them. I'll get mine. We'll go over and check the son-in-law. You got his address? Yeah, it's a place out on Ivar. Sure was a nice old man, huh? Yeah, he seems to be. So you want to grab my coat? I'll get the phone. Yeah, I'll get it. Thank you. Homicide Friday. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, John. When? Yeah. No, we'll be right over. Right away. You bet. Frank. Yeah? Call from the bartender, Johnny. Yeah? Says he just got another phone call. Person told him that he'd gotten the down payment for the job, and he wanted to know why Ulrich hadn't been killed. Yeah. Guy said if Johnny didn't get on it, the money wouldn't do him any good. Told him to make up his own mind. Uh -huh. Either he makes good on the job or they'll kill him. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Seven ten p.m. We got to the bar on 6th Street. There were only a couple of people in the place. The bartender, Johnny, told us of the phone call that he'd received. He said that the person on the phone had told him that if he didn't hurry up and kill Ulrich, Johnny himself would be taken care of. We called Lee Jones at the crime lab to ask him if he'd been able to come up with anything on the letter. He told us that there was no way of tracing it. Fingerprints found on the letter were those of the bartender. Photographs were taken of the letter, and along with the money, it was booked for further evidence. We'd gotten in touch with the postal authorities, and they said that they'd give us assistance. They gave us the location of the box where the letter had been mailed, and they said they'd try to find out who sent it. We arranged for a stakeout on the bar, and then we called the men at Ulrich's home. They told us that the son-in-law, Davis, and Ulrich's daughter had been there, but that no one else had seen or spoken to the elderly man. 9.32 p.m., Frank and I drove out to check on Robert Davis. We got to the apartment house and rang the bell to the manager's room. Yes? Miss Franklin? Yes, what is it? Police officers, ma'am. We'd like to talk to you if we could. Oh, well, I suppose it's all right. Come on in. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ma'am. This is my partner, Frank Smith. My name's Friday. What is it you wanted to see me about? Well, we'd like to talk to you about one of your tenants, please. Oh? Which one? I bet I can guess. Ma'am. It's about that couple on the fifth floor, isn't it? The Radcliffe's. It's them, isn't it? No, ma'am, it isn't. We'd like to talk to you about a Robert Davis and his wife. The Davises? Yes, ma'am. Why? Well, never thought it. Should be the Radcliffe's the way they carry on. The Davises. Well, I'd never have thought it. What do you want to know about them? Well, it's just a routine investigation, ma'am. Can you tell us how long they lived here? Well, see now. It's been almost six years. They've been in the building, yeah. 
Yeah, six years, anyway. I happen to always live in the same apartment, though. Ma'am? When they moved in, they was in a little apartment on the second floor, living room, a pull-down bed, little bitty place. And then they moved up to the sixth floor, two-bedroom, nice place. Nice people. The Davis is all right. Never thought it. Do they have any close friends in the building, would you know? Well, not Mr. Davies. He's kind of the quiet type. Never has much to do with anybody he keeps to himself. Mm -hmm. Now, Mrs. Davis, that's a different thing. She's a living doll. She's nice to everybody and so sweet. Never had a harsh word for anybody. Always a smile. I think Mr. Davis thinks he's too good for anybody. He always seems kind of snooty. Yes, ma'am. Do you ever have any arguments with anybody in the building that you might know of? Well, he's had a few arguments like everybody else does. Like I said before, he thinks he's too good for anybody. He thinks he's better than anybody. He's got no right to, either. Ma'am? Why, well, he owes half the people in the neighborhood money. Way behind his bills. Owes me a couple of months' rent. Never seems to be able to pay anybody he owes. I talked to the milkman. Owes him for a month back. Every time he asks for his money, Davis tells him to come back and stop hounding him. Can't understand it. Seemed like such nice people when they moved in. Uh, two years ago, that's when the trouble started. Uh-huh. It was our understanding that he had a pretty good job. Is that and right? he has. Uh, works for his father-in-law, manages some kind of a factory. Uh, dresses, I think. Oh, but that isn't it. He makes enough money. He just spends it faster than he makes it, that's all. I think he gambles. Why do you say that, ma'am? Oh, he's always going off on some kind of business trip. At least that's what he says it is, but I know different. Yes, how's that now? Well, he'd come back from one of those business trips once. Cab pulled up, and uh, it just happened that I was standing out in front. A driver got out and gave him the bill for the cab all the way from the airport. Almost six dollars. Well, anyway, when Mr. Davis got the money out of his pocket to pay the cab bill, a chip fell on the sidewalk. He didn't think that I saw it, but I did. A cab driver did, too. Well, what kind of a chip was it, ma'am? Uh, well, you understand I'm not a gambling woman, so I wouldn't know. But the cab driver, he knew. Oh, you just betcha he knew right away. He picked up the chip and handed it back to Mr. Davis and said something about being in Las Vegas, kind of kidding, you know. Yes, ma'am. Well, I've seen Mr. Davis get upset, but never like that. He grabbed the chip away from the cab driver and told him to mind his own business. Said that he'd had to chip a long time, that it didn't concern the cab driver. He was real mean. Uh-huh. And then at night, well, the argument that he and the missus had, I never in all my days heard anything like that. Well, what happened, ma'am? Well, uh, you understand that I just happened to be in the hall. I was making sure that the lights on the floor were all on. Those bulbs are always burning out, and I was checking them, you know. Yes, ma'am. Well, anyways, I hear this argument coming from the Davis's apartment. Mrs. Davis is telling how she isn't going to stand for it anymore. Mr. Davis better settle down and get to work and stop this foolishness. She didn't come right out and say what foolishness, but I could tell. I could tell. It was his gambling, that's what it was. Yes, ma'am. Is there anything else that you could think of that you could tell us about the Davises? Uh, no, I don't think so. I'm kind of surprised, though. I don't like him, but I never thought that he'd have the police after him. Well, we're just conducting a routine investigation, Miss Franklin. Oh, now, you don't have to play cagey with me. I know about you, policeman. You and your routine investigations, you ain't fooling me. You want him for something. Now, what is it? Can you tell me? Ma'am, it's just police business, just routine. We'd appreciate it if you didn't say anything to anybody about us being here. Oh, sure, I'll go along with you. I won't tell a soul, not a living soul. Thank you very much, Miss Franklin. I'm going to leave you our card. We'd appreciate it if you give us a call if anything comes up. Uh-huh. Um, Michigan 5211, is that right? Yes, ma'am. You just ask for the homicide division. It's oh, written down. All right, there, you just bet I will. Now, I'd be glad to help. I'm just glad to. All right, fine. Uh, one thing, though. Yes, ma'am? Are you sure there ain't nothing that you want those people on the fifth floor for? The Radcliffe's? From the manager's office, we called the Ulrich home. We talked to Mr. Ulrich. He told us about the visit that afternoon from the Davises. He said that he hadn't told Robert Davis anything about the threats on his life. We went upstairs and talked to Davis. We told him that we had a serious matter to discuss with him, and we asked him to accompany us down to the city hall. I don't know what you're talking about. I told the police everything I know about this a year ago. I don't know anything about it. I wish I could help, but I can't. You know, this got me worried. Well, if you haven't done anything wrong, you got nothing to worry about. I haven't done anything wrong. In here. Mm. Go ahead. Mm. All right. Now tell me what this is all about. Frank? Yeah. You want to check the office, see if we got any answers to the calls this afternoon? All right.
You got a cigarette? Yeah. Help yourself. Well, let's get to it, huh? I'm gonna get home and get some sleep. I got a rough day tomorrow. This won't take very long. How do you get along with your father in law? All right, why? Like to know? Well, I don't see how that concerns you, but you ask, so I'll tell you. We get along fine, me and the old man. We get along just great. Does that make you happy? That's not the point. Anything? No, nothing new. You over to Las Vegas much, Davis? Not much. Why? How often would you say you went over there? Maybe a couple times a year, not any more than that. When was the last time? What's so important about when I was in Vegas last? You guys spent a little more time finding out who's trying to kill my father-in-law, less time asking questions that don't make any sense. You'd be doing a better job. What can you tell us about somebody trying to kill your father-in-law? All I know is what he told me this afternoon. What did he tell you? Not much. Said something about a bartender, something about a phone call. Did he tell you who the bartender was? No, just that it was someplace over on 6th. All right, Davis, come off it, huh? What do you mean, come off it? You want to tell us why you did it, or do you want us to tell you? Did what? I got nothing to tell you. I don't know what you guys are talking about. We talked to your father-in-law this morning. We told him that we'd gotten a report that his life had been threatened. We didn't tell him how it happened. We didn't tell him where our information came from, so he didn't know. All right, so maybe I got it someplace else. Oh, wait a minute. You couldn't have. We didn't talk to anybody else. Well, I heard it someplace. I don't remember, but I heard it. We checked around, found out you gamble quite a lot. You're a steady loser. You owe a lot of money in town, don't you? They're right. Yeah, that's right. I think we can make you for the threat on Ulrich's life. I don't think we'll have any trouble at all. You had the motive. You had the opportunity. First thing in the morning, we'll check with the factory. We'll see if you made a withdrawal of $500. We make that, and you've got big trouble. You figure you're going to be able to do that? We think so, yeah. We'll get your father-in-law down here and ask him what he told you this afternoon. Find out if he did tell you about that bartender, about the bar on 6th, about the phone call. You know, it doesn't look like there's going to be too much trouble making you for this. Save your time. What do you mean? You don't have to go through that trash. I did it. I tried to have the old man knocked off. Were you the one who sent him the wine last year? Yeah. That's when it started. I started to gamble. Lost a lot of money. Couldn't pay it back. No way to pay it back. Guys I owed the money to were leaning on me. I had to pay them off. Had to. Yeah. I can only think of one way, get rid of the old man. Didn't you get a pretty good salary out of working for him? Yeah, pretty good, but it didn't go far, not far enough. I tried to win it back, make good on the losses I had. I couldn't do it. The more I gambled, the worse it got. I just couldn't do it. There wasn't any other way. No other way. I decided to kill the old man. It's the only way. Can't you see that? It's the only way I could get clear. Yeah. I figured if I could get rid of the old man, I'd have everything fixed. Everything would be okay. I guess it worked out all right anyway. What do you mean? Well, there's nothing in the book they can throw at me. He's still alive. I didn't kill him. Who got hurt? You did. Well, how do you figure? I didn't kill him. You're going to jail for trying. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On June 18th, trial was held in Department 89, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Robert Walter Davis was tried and convicted of attempted homicide. He received sentence as prescribed by law. Attempted homicide is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not less than 20 years. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Vic Perrin. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Martin and Lewis show Tuesday on this same NBC station. Tonight, it's Adventure with Barry Craig on NBC. It doesn't really get better than that. If you want a police detective procedural drama, Dragnet. Dragnet was the best of the best, and... Uh, Longevity sometimes proves that. It was on the air for many, many years, nine seasons on radio, 17 seasons on television, I re- plus many movies. I remember it on television do in you? the 60s. Yeah. I do. I remember watching, I don't remember if I ever watched the black and white versions. I mean, I've seen them now on DVD and things, but I, I remember watching.